Hi guys, welcome to the summary video for acid and bases, right? So um, in this video, I actually showing you more details, right? Like the slides that I used to use in, in lecture. Okay, but I cut on a lot of uh, questions, <coughs> a lot of practice questions. But of course, uh, I can share it with you if you need that, right? So let's move on. Now, this is the learning outcomes that you need to achieve. So number one, able to tell acid base according to Arrhenius Bronsted Lewy theory, understand strength of acid and bases, able to use water equilibrium constant KW to determine pH, able to define buffer and explain its function using equation. So these are the learning outcomes you need to achieve at the end of the lesson. All right. So let's start with this. Now, what is acid and what is base? These are the basic characteristics of an acid and base. So for pH less than seven, we call that as an acid. It tastes sour. It reacts with base or alkaline, all right? Proton donor, turn litmus paper red, okay? A loss of concentration H plus or H3O plus, which means the concentration of H plus or H2O plus in a solution is higher than the rest, then we call that as an acid. And it reacts with metal to produce hydrogen gas. Okay, now for bases, pH more than seven. Now don't be con don't be confused between base and alkaline. Now, base is the general term that used to define any solutions pH more than seven or any compounds that give you pH more than seven. It tastes bitter. It reacts with acid neutralization. Its proton value uh, is a proton acceptor, and the concentration of proton is much lower. The concentration of hydroxide ion is much higher. Okay, then we call that as a base, and it will not react with metal. Okay, now what is the difference between base and alkali? Alkaline is actually a base that able to dissolve in water. For example, NaO, sodium oxide. Okay, when dissolved in water, you get sodium hydroxide. That's what we call alkali. Okay, but other metals, for example, copper oxide. Copper oxide is a metal oxide. It's also a base. But when you put it into the water, no reactions happen. It will not dissolve. So we call copper oxide as a base, but not an alkaline. Okay, so that's the simple introduction to acid and base. And you see that at the bottom here, it states that both are electrolytes. Now, what is that mean by electrolytes? Electrolytes means they have free moving ions and able to conduct electricity okay so first theory Arrhenius concept now what is this Arrhenius concept I believe you guys have some ideas on what is this Arrhenius theory is um, is a theory that you learn from high school I believe so what is that Arrhenius theory Arrhenius theory is defining acid as a compound that able to dissolve in water producing H plus okay like in this two HCl, HNO3, hydrochloric acid and nitric acid, both able to dissolve in water, both are soluble in water and able to dissociate to form high concentration of H+. Okay, that's why we call that as acid. And here, increases the concentration of hydronium ions. Now, don't get confused here. H+, is actually equivalent to H3O+. But it, this is actually the simple version. For example, I have HCl. I include water into the equation and I try to dissociate. Now what will happen is you will get Cl minus and the H will go over here to form H3O plus. That's the actual equation. But we used to write this equation instead, right? HCl straight dissociate into H plus and Cl minus without water. Now why is it without water? Because water is just a solvent and for them to dissociate into ions. So it can be written in this form or it can be written in this form. So don't get confused between H plus and H3O plus and, and thinking that both are actually different things. They are the same. Okay, so you can call it as hydrogen ion, which is this. You can call it as hydronium ion, which is this. All right, so the next one is Arrhenius basis. So how they define a base? A base should able to dissolve in water, which means alkaline, all right, that able to produce or increase the concentration of hydroxide ion. See that? Any compounds that dissolve in water producing OH minus, we call that as Arrhenius base or Arrhenius alkali. Okay, this is uh, much straightforward as long as you plus water. 
Okay, and then you will get any plus and a H minus. This is um, uh, more straightforward compared to an acid. So basically, Arrhenius' concept states that an acid should able to dissolve in water, producing hydrogen ions or hydronium ions. Arrhenius' base is a compound that able to dissolve in water to produce high concentration of hydroxide ions. Okay, so that's Arrhenius' theory. Now, bronsted lowry theory, this is another theory. Now, basically, they are the same, just that they are looking at different things. Okay, so in bronsted lowry theory, an acid is a species that donates protons. Okay, this one can be H3O+, same thing, or we call that as proton donor. And a base is a species that accepts protons from an acid in a chemical reaction. Now, the examples given here below is uh, quite obvious. For example, now, if you look at this, initially I have HA plus B minus. Then you check. From HA, at the end of the reaction, is converted into A minus. Can I say it loses a proton? It loses hydrogen ion. Yes, right? So, we can call this as proton donor because it donates proton in a chemical reaction. At the end, it loses a proton. And for B minus here, what happened at the end? From B minus, it changes into HB, right? Can I say this is actually a proton acceptor? Yes, right? It accepts a proton in a reaction. So we call this as an acid when it is a proton donor. We call this as a base when it is a proton acceptor. And what will happen when they have, uh, when they have low lost their protons when they have accepted a proton? Now, see ya. Here, the Hb. All right, we call that as conjugate acid. Why is it an acid then? Because if you look at this reaction in a backward, from right to left, what happened to the Hb when they convert back into B minus? Again, it acts as a proton donor. It loses a proton. So then this HB is an acid for backward reaction. But we don't call it as an acid on both sides because that would be confusing. So if you're looking at the backward reaction, this is an acid, we call that as a conjugate acid. All right, now again, look at A minus. What will happen if you go backward? A minus is converting back into HA. The A minus is accepting a proton. All right, so we call that as a base because it's a proton acceptor, but because this is an equilibrium and we have left and right so we call that as conjugate base all right in short now guys um let's say a proton donor which is an acid in a reaction at the end of the reaction it will turn into a conjugate base it will act as a proton acceptor. Okay, when they go backward. You see that? So proton donor will change into conjugate base and conjugate base will change back into proton donor, which is an acid. So this is the conjugate acid base pair. All right, so what if you have a base? Let's say I started up with a proton acceptor in a reaction, which is a base. At the end of the reaction, it will turn into conjugate acid, okay? And this conjugate acid can act as a proton donor for it to go back into a base, which is a proton acceptor. All right, so if you look at the next slide. Now, conjugate pairs. So let's look at the first equation here. HNO2 is an acid, it labels as acid. H2O is a base, double check then, why is it an acid? HNO3 convert into NO2 minus, it donates a proton in a reaction, whereas H2O is actually accepting a proton in a reaction. Sorry guys, this is supposed to be H3O plus, okay? And what happened when an acid donated its proton to the base? When it donated the proton, it becomes NO2 minus, and we call this as an conjugate base. From an acid, it turns into a conjugate base. From a base, it turns into a, a conjugate acid. 
okay, which is opposite. Acid turn into base, base turn, turn into acid. It's just with additional words conjugate. All right. And the next equation, as usual, HPO4 two minus. What does it change to? H2PO4. It's accepting a proton here, right? So we call that as a base. And when this base accepted a proton, it turns into conjugate acid. All right. And then for NH4 plus, it converts into NH3. It donates a proton in a reaction. That's why it's an acid. But at the end, after they have donated the protons, it acts as a conjugate base because, yeah, when you go backwards, you actually act as a proton acceptor. See that? So it's on both sides, but usually we will move from left to right. Reactants to product, so we name acid base on the left, conjugate acid base and conjugate base on the right. All right, so this is conjugate pairs. Now, these are some examples of questions here. Okay, examples of questions. Okay, let's look at a question here. Now, consider the following acid base equilibrium. In the reactions above, the bronze sulfuric acid are, so which one is actually the bronze sulfuric acid? Look from the left, okay, look from the left, which is the reactants, which one actually donates a proton in this reaction? So we can see from here the H2O. It's actually changing into OH. So, which means H2O is actually an acid. Right? So, H2O is an acid. Either this or this. There's another one. Look from the left hand side. Sorry. Look from the right hand side, which is on this side. Okay? So, um, let's do this. If on the other side, which one do you think acting as an acid? A bronze sulfuric acid which donates a proton. So, H2CO3 converts into HCO3 minus. Yeah, it donates a proton, right? So this one is also an acid, or we call that as a conjugate acid. Remember that? So therefore, the answer, which one, uh, the above, which pair above are actually bronze sulfuric acid? Answer is C. Okay, so the next one, consider following bronze sulfuric equilibrium system. What are the two bronze sulfuric bases in equilibrium? Now, this is just the opposite. Which one is the base? Let's look from the left hand side. Which one is the base? Um, the one that accepts proton, which is this. See that? From here to here, it accepted a proton. So this is the base. And on the other side, on the right hand side, which one is actually the base? So which one accepted a proton? This one. See that? From here to here, accepted one proton. So the combinations of uh, H2PO4, and SO3 2 minus. See that? So answer is B. Okay, so yeah, let's move on. Now, the next thing after this um, bronze sulfuric acid and base, we look at strong and weak acid. Now, the relative strength of an acid depends on the extent of dissociation of the acid solution. Now, the strongest acid is the one with the greatest degree, uh, greatest degree of dissociation. Now, what does that mean? The acid strength is actually based on the concentration of H plus ion in the solution. The higher the concentration, the stronger the acid. For example, I have HCl, all right? It dissociates in water. You get H plus ion plus Cl minus, both equal because it mixes water, all right? Now, if I put this sign, means what? Reversible, right? Reversible means if I'm using 0 0.5 mole per dm cube here, how many mole per dm cube of H plus do you expect to get? Do you expect to get 0 0.5? Yes, the ratio is 1 to 1. But don't forget this is a reversible reaction, which means the 0 0.5 here will not completely convert into H plus and Cl minus. So I will expect the concentration of H plus here is less than 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. Okay, so if you're using 0 0.5 mole per dm cube of the acid, but at the end, you only get less than 0 0.5 mole per dm cube of the H plus produced. So the concentration of H plus produced is less than the original concentration of the acid, which means this is a weak acid. All right, so I'll give you an example. Let's say I have a strong acid. Okay, I have a strong acid. So in, the, in terms of a strong acid, let's say um, 
sorry uh, guys, the examples given just on HCL, uh, I show it a reversible sign, which is um, supposed to be a strong acid. Uh, I'm just showing as an exa example. So HCL is actually a strong acid, all right? So let's say I choose another acid, which is a strong acid, HNO3, all right? So this one, if I'm using 0 0.5 mole per dm cube, for example, same thing. And then I try to dissolve it in water. See the sign? It's complete, right? And then I will get H plus and NO3 minus both aqueous because it dissolves in water. And what happens here? If I'm using 0 0.5 mole per dm cube of HNO3, and this is a complete reaction, not a reversible reaction, hence the concentration of the H plus is expected to be the same, 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. See that? One to one ratio and it's complete. So if the concentration of the acid used, same as the concentration of the H plus produced in the reaction, then we can call this as a strong acid. Okay, so basically, if an acid were fully dissociates in water, we call that as a strong acid. If an acid were not fully dissociate or partially dissociates in water to give the H plus, we call that as a weak acid. Okay, so uh, the diagram here is actually quite uh, obvious. See that? I'm using HA as an acid. At the end, I get the same amount of H plus, as in same concentration. So this is a strong acid. From here, I'm using a weak acid as HB. Okay, at the end, do I get the same amount of H plus? No, only this amount, which is much smaller than what we used to have here from the acid. So the amount of H plus is much smaller, therefore we call that as a weak acid. Okay, so this is between strong and weak acid. Um, these are another examples for it. See that? This is a strong acid because HCl will fully dissociate in water to give this too. And it's a complete reaction. What about this? When you see reversible reaction, this acid is a weak acid. Complete reaction, strong base. This is a strong base. Reversible. This is a weak base. All right, so the first thing to check is, when I give an equation, first thing to check is whether it's an acid or base. Of course, you need to know that, okay? This is an acid or this is a base. Next thing to check whether the arrow given is reversible or a complete reaction. If it is a complete, definitely it's a strong acid or a strong base. If it is reversible, then it will be a weak acid or weak base. Or you can compare in terms of its concentration. You calculate the concentration of the acid, let's say equals to 0 0.8 mole per dm cube. And then you calculate the concentration of H plus here, equals to 0 0.8 mole per dm cube. What does it mean? It's a strong acid. But what if you're not getting 0 0.8 here? When I calculate the H plus produced, it's actually only 0 0.5 which is lesser than 0 0.8. What does it mean? This is a weak acid then. Okay, so this is uh, re uh, the, the, the way to check whether you have a strong acid, strong base, or weak acid, weak base. All right, so let's move on. Another more example for you. Um, these are the common strong acids, HCRO, HNO3, HClO4, H2SO4. Strong bases, group one and some group two hydroxide. These are all strong acid and strong base. Again, guys, you don't have to actually remember it. You don't memorize it, okay? The information from the, from the question should be enough for you to identify whether it's a weak acid or strong acid. Either it's a weak base or a strong base, okay? From what I said just now, either from the equations or from the calculation. Later, I'll show you how to calculate the concentration of acid and as well as the H plus, all right? Weak acid, just an example. Weak acid is basically all organic acids. For example, ethanol acid, which is a vinegar. They call it as acetic acid. Or carbonic acid. When you dissolve carbon dioxide gas into a water, then you are getting a carbonic acid solution, which is very weak. That's how we can drink carbonated drinks. Okay, All carbonated drinks are actually weak acid, which is carbonic acid. Okay, And for weak base, here they put it as ammonium hydroxide and the, the name is ammonia. Basically when ammonia dissolves in water, then you will get ammonium hydroxide. So when I say ammonia aqueous, 
I'm actually referring to ammonium hydroxide. All right, if you want to put ammonia alone like that, and this one should be referring to NH3 and it should be a gas. Okay, ammonia gas, it's always a gas under standard conditions. So when ammonia dissolved in water is no longer known as ammonia, it known as, as ammonium hydroxide. All right, so these are the examples of acid and base, strong acid, weak acid, strong base, weak base. Moving on, now that's the calculation. What is pH? Now pH is, everybody know it's a pH scale. Zero to six are considered acidic pH. Eight to 14 are considered as alkaline pH or basic, right? And seven is the neutral pH. Now bear in mind, this pH scale is actually um, not the actual value, it's actually a, um, what we call that, um, a calibrated scale. You know what is calibrated scale? For example, they take the strongest acid they can ever measure and put it as zero, okay? And then they take the strongest base they can ever measure and put it as 14. And the remaining acid-base compound that exists between them, the one that weaker acid will appear at one, two, three, four, five, six, the one that weaker than the, the strongest base will be placed at 13 to eight. And of course, neutral means, yeah, same concentration of, neutral means same concentration of, square bracket is concentration, uh, guys, same concentration of H plus and OH minus in the solution, then we call that as a neutral solution. If one of it, the H plus or the OH minus, one of it is higher, then they're either acidic or alkaline. Okay, so the pH scale is just a calibrated scale. It's not representing the color or the value does not represent the actual acidity of the solution. Okay, um, why am I saying that? Later I'll show you the equations here, the formula, and then I'll show you one example. You will realize what, what I'm trying to say. Now, pH of the solution is defined as a negative logarithm to the base of 10 and the hydrogen ion concentration in mole per dm cube. Now, what is the formula here? You need to pay attention. This is the one. To calculate pH, this is a straightforward calculation. pH equals to negative log base 10 concentration of the H plus. Okay, but if you're calculating, um, say for example, a base solution, for example, NOH, you can't use pH equals to minus log H plus because in NOH, you don't have enough H plus. Then you use this, pH equals to negative log POH equals to negative log base 10 OH minus. You will have high concentration of OH for a base solution. And then you calculate, you get a POH, right? But that's not pH. So how to get pH? This one. pH plus POH equals to 14. And if you found out that your POH is seven, for example, and what is your pH? Seven. If this one is six, then change accordingly. This is your pH, which is a six. Are you getting me? I'm gonna show you an example here. Okay, um, let's say, based on the formula, uh, this side I'm gonna do an acid calculation. This side I'm gonna do a base calculation. Okay, um, again guys, this formula, Initially, we are we applied for strong acid and strong base. All right. So let's say I have HCl. Let's say I have um, two mole per dm cube of HCl. Okay. The question asks, what is the pH of this solution? Two mole per dm cube of HCl. Then what we can do? We check the equation. HCl dissociate into H plus and Cl minus. It's a strong acid, and you will fully dissociate. So if I'm using two mole per dm cube here, here should be two mole per dm cube, right? So we take this concentration. And how do we do that? pH equals to minus log concentration of H plus equals to minus log zero, uh, not zero, it's two. See that? Minus log two. And then you press the calculator, just a minute. Oh, 
So minus log 2, guys. Wow. Guess what? You're getting negative 0 0.3. Then you may start asking this. Is that possible to have a pH of negative values? Because from the pH scale given on top, it's only 0 to 14. How can you get negative values? Now, that's what I'm trying to say just now. The pH scale given from 0 to 14 is just a calibrated scale. They use the strongest acid and the stronger base, put it at 0 and 14. But does that reflect the actual pH of the solution? No, not really. So it's possible for you to get a negative value. Let's say you have two molar, you already get a negative 0 0.3. Imagine you have 10 mole per dm cube of HCl. What will be the pH? Let's say we use a calculator to press log 10. See that? You get a negative 1 pH. So to calculate the pH of the solution, we don't just base on the pH scale. pH scale is just to reflect that, okay, this is about uh, red color. So based on the scale, red color is uh, between 0 to 3. See that? Or 0 to 2. So this is not an actual pH. To get an actual pH, you have to use a pH meter, a digital meter, and you put a prop inside the electrode and measure, and it will show you negative 0 0.3, negative 1, or 1, 2, 3, 4. That's the exact way. And in terms of calculation, this is the formula to calculate pH of a solution. So don't be surprised to get the negative values when you calculate the pH. All right. So next, I'm going to show you the base, um, common strong base, for example, NOH. All right. Let's say uh, this NOH will dissociate into Na plus and OH minus. And I'm using, why not, right? Not. Uh, we use uh, 0 0.5. Let's say, per dm cube, okay? So if I have 0 0.5 mole per dm cube of NOH, what's the concentration of OH do you expect? One, two, one. And it's a strong base, so 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. And what next? Now I got the concentration of OH minus. What to do next? We need to calculate. What is the formula? We can't calculate pH straight away because we only have the concentration of OH minus. So we calculate PO h equals to minus log concentration of oh minus and we put that in poh equals to negative log 0 0.5 let's press the calculator minus log 0 0.5 you're actually getting 0 0.3 all right so you get 0 0.3 is that your answer no this is poh you're calculating oh minus then what is the ph of this noh solution ph equals to 14 minus 0 0.3 you will get 13.7 see that now that's your final answer 13.7 pH which makes sense 13.7 is more than 7 is around here that indicates a base you see that so to calculate the pH for a base you need an extra step which is calculate the pOH first then only you use 14 minus P O H to get pH because pH plus P O H equals to 14. Okay, so that's about it. This is how you calculate a pH for an acid and base. And next, I'm going to tell you how and why pH plus P O H equals to 14. You may ask these questions already. Why is it equals to 14? Because of the pH scale 0 to 14? Yes, that's part of it. Next slide, I'm going to explain why pH plus pOH equals to 14 in a mathematical way. All right, so the next one is about equilibrium constant for water. Now, we learned that in a previous topic. What is that equilibrium constant? Product over reactant. And what about the equilibrium constant for water? How would it look like? Water is H2O, a liquid, partially dissociate into H plus and OH minus. See that? And then when we write the K expression, product over reactant. So I'm going to put product concentration of H plus multiplied with concentration of OH minus. And do I need to divide by H2O? H2O here is a liquid, right? And still remember, liquid or pure liquid water doesn't count as part of the equilibrium constant. So this one we can ignore, which is equals to 1. Therefore, 
the kw here equals the concentration of h plus multiplied the concentration of oh minus and this expression this equation is always true at 25 degrees c why am i saying so is always true because at 25 degrees c this kw is given as a value in your data booklet okay it's actually 1.0 times 10 to the power of negative 14. this is actually the kw or the equilibrium constant for pure water you good with that so this value will not change as long as the temperature remain the same so if i change the temperature 25 to 26 27 28 or below 24 23 this value will definitely change because equilibrium constant is affected by temperature if you still remember it all right so this is the first thing about kw and what what's so important about that like i said i'm going to show you why ph e, ph plus poh equals to 14. all right let's do it again i'm going to show you a mathematical way how to do that now kw equals to 1 times 10 to the power of negative 14 all right this is the value and the expression is actually equivalent to concentration of h plus multiplied with concentration of oh minus for pure water now let's use pure water to calculate okay so 1 times 10 to the power of negative 14 equals to this So what would be the concentration of H plus from pure water, which is this? How do I do that? Again, H2O, dissociate into H plus and OH minus. Can I say concentration of H plus, same as the concentration of OH minus? Yeah, one, two, one, they're always the same. So if that's the case, then we can do it this way, H plus squared. Make sense because OH is the same as H plus, so I can put it as a square all together into one term, which is H plus. Then we do this. All right, and what is the concentration of H plus from water? Square root 1 times 10 to the power negative 14 equals to a concentration of H plus. And then what would you get? Square root 1 times 10 to the power negative 14, you get. One times ten to the power of negative seven. That's a H plus. You okay? So, if this is the concentration of H plus, what is the pH then? Because we have the concentration of H plus, we can anytime calculate the pH. Let's do this. pH equals to negative log concentration of H plus equals to negative log concentration of h plus which is 1 times 10 to one negative 7 and then what do you get press your calculator you will show it as 7 so ph equals to 7 for pure water which makes sense neutral right and then we're going to do another side for poh ph equals to 7 proven all right next we go for poh again 1 times 10 to one negative 14 equals to H plus and OH minus. What is the concentration of OH minus from water? Again, H plus equals to OH minus from the equilibrium, always, right? Then I can rewrite it as H plus, uh, sorry, OH minus squared. One times ten to one negative fourteen. Basically, it's the same thing, just the OH minus. And then I square root this equals to concentration of OH minus. And what do you get? 1 times 10 to 1, negative 7 equals to OH minus. And then POH equals to minus log 1 times 10 to the power negative 7. You get POH equals to 7. So just now, pH equals to 7. POH now equals to 7. So pH plus POH equals to 14. And that's how it works. And again, guys, we are actually work this out based on this value which is constant at 25 degrees c so this theory only applicable when the temperature is 25 other than that this value will change basically what i meant was uh, what i meant is if the temperature is not 25 
even the pH scale here, 1 to 14, 0 to 14, will have to change. Okay, so this is how it works for equilibrium constant of water. And if you realize that I can actually use this formula, Kw, 1 times 10 to the power negative 14 equals to H plus OH, right? I can use this formula to calculate pH of any solution. So you can use this or you can use the formula I give you here. So it's up to you, all right? Let's move on. Now, these are examples of calculating pH, uh, which I already show you. Um, maybe I can show you this alone, see what happens, all right? So first, I write the equation. H2SO4 is a strong acid. Fully dissociate into H plus and SO4 2 minus. Balance equation, guys, don't forget 2 H plus. And if I'm using 0 0.1 mole per dm cube here, what is the concentration of H plus here? 1, 2, 2. So 0 0.2 mole per dm cube. Now, that's the thing you need to pay attention. Your H plus now is 0 0.2 instead of 0 0.1 because you are producing 2 H plus from one acid depends on the acid used. All right, then what is the pH of it? pH equals to minus log, put in the concentration of H plus, which is 0 0.2, then you will get your answer. Answer here is 0 0.69. No unit uh, for pH, it's just numbers 0 0.69, that will do. Okay, I'm just showing you one, the rest, I, I, I believe you can do it yourself. Let's move on. Okay, next will be acid base titration. Now, first I need to explain what is titration. Titration is something like that. We are trying to determine the concentration of an unknown solution. For example, I have a conical flask here. I have 25 centimeter cubic of HCl. But the concentration of these HCl It's unknown. We are not sure how many HCl in it. What is the concentration? I just give you the volume. Okay, take this 25 cm cube, put it into conical flask. I want you to find out the concentration of HCl. So how do we actually identify the concentration of HCl? Titration. What is that titration? We need a burette. Sorry. Ah. Uh. It's a control, okay, a burette. And inside the burette, we put in something, a compound that can react with acid, HCl. So what do you think? Of course, a base. So let's say I put in NaH. And this is actually with known concentration though, 0 0.5 mole per dm cube. Okay, I know the concentration. Of course, you need to have one known, one unknown. Otherwise, you can't, you can't get the, the unknown, right? So. I have the concentration of NOH and I filled up the whole burette. The full burette is about 50 centimeter cubic. I just filled it up because I'm not sure how much I need to neutralize all the acid in the conical flask. So I just fill it up and then I will just open this tab and drop the base inside to neutralize the acid. But then how do we know the acid in the conical flask here, the HCl, has been neutralized? How do we know how much we should add in? And how do we know when are we going to stop adding NOH into HCl? We need one thing before we drop it in. We call that as here, the indicator. Indicator is a compound, basically it's a weak acid that will change color according to the pH of a solution. So if I'm neutralizing HCl, when the HCl has been neutralized, the solution should turn into neutral. Then the indicator should show a neutral color so that we know, okay, it's done. It's neutral now, we should stop adding NOH. Okay, so we need an indicator. Later I show you the different types of indicator. Now in this case, uh, I start dropping it in, for example, and then the color of the indicator change, right? It changed. So um, what is the amount of um, NOH added? Let's say I've added right, 25 cm cubic of NOH added into it. All right? And then this concentration, this is a volume needed to neutralize all the HCl. Okay, indicator change color, neutral. So what next, guys, once we have found out that? Then we route the equations, of course. Okay, we route the equations. Sorry, guys, uh, because of words in between, I'll have to write in the gaps. 
So let's say HCl plus, and then we write the equation because we want to know the ratio. You get NaCl plus H2O. Balance equation, 1 to 1. So then we calculate 0 0.5 times 25, MV or 1000. What is the mole of NaOH used? 0 0.5 times 25 divided by 1000, you get 0 0.0125. Okay, that's the mole. So the ratio is 1 to 1. So what is the number of mole of HCl in the conical plus? 0 0.0125. Right? And then after that, would you able to calculate the concentration of HCl based on the mole as well as the volume in the conical plus? Yes. yes. Right? You just use the same formula, MV or 1000, then you can get the concentration. So 0 0.0125 times 1000 over 25 you will get the concentration here equal to 0 0.5 mole per dm3. See that? So this is the function and this is the titration. So we are trying to identify an unknown concentration, an unknown solution using another reagent. In this case, it's very straightforward, acid-base titration. We're trying to identify the concentration of a base or the concentration of an acid using a base of an acid for a neutralization to take place. All right, so that's um, titrations. Okay, now come back to the slide here. The point at which the reaction is complete, which means they fully neutralized, is referred to as the equivalent point. So when a solution has been fully neutralized, like just now, we are at NOH into it, the indicator change color. So at this point, we stop adding NOH because we know that HCl has been neutralized. And what we do call this point as equivalent point. Okay? And it is important to choose an indicator so that the end point matches the equivalent point. What is that an end point? End point is when indicator change color. So let's say initially you add in as yellow, all right? When they turn yellow into something else, for example, they turn yellow into red, that point when they turn, we call that as end point. And the end point here, the color of the indicator change, must match with the equivalent point, which indicates the reaction is complete. So these two must match. The end point must be the same as the equivalent point, which means both must happen at the same time. Then the indicator U is a suitable indicator. Now imagine that I'm adding an indicator, they change color before actually the reaction complete. So is that data accurate? No, right? So we have to add an indicator, will change color exactly at the point when the reaction has completed, exactly at the point when the neutralization has completed, right? So these two must match. That is a suitable indicator, all right? So yeah, that's the um, acid-base titration with the terms that you have to familiarize with. And these are the examples of indicators um, from your uh, from this week, the experiment, they ask you to use a red cabbage water, right? The red cabbage water, which is the first one. If you can't get a red cabbage, you can get a red onion, turmeric powder. So these are the common things you can get from the market. And then you can use it as a natural indicator, okay? But from here onwards, guys, from here onwards, like um, turmeric, uh, no, phenolphthalein, bromotyma blue, red limus, blue limus, universal indicator, all these are actually a chemical. They are actually weak acid. And they can change color because they are colored itself. Okay, we will learn this in details again in Sam 2, how they actually change color. But for now, you just need to know these are the available um, indicators and they will change color. Again, guys, you will, you, will, uh, you will definitely ask me this question, do I need to memorize the color change? All right, the answer is no. Only the common one, you need to have an idea, but usually in the questions, they will tell you what is the color change and you should stop, especially during the experiment, okay? During the experiment of titration. All right, so don't remember that, but you need to know the presence of phenolphthalein. You, you need to have an impression of phenolphthalein. Yeah, I, 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 I heard about this, I, I seen this. Phenolphthalein is an indicator for acid-base titration. Bromotimo blue, methyl orange, 
Okay, some of you may have heard of it, right? All these are common indicators used. Okay, now, the following slides, including this, I'm going to explain a little bit on how a titration curve looks like when you carry out a titration. This curve is to represent the whole process, how the pH change when you add certain amount of acid into a base. Or it can be the other way around, this one can be in the base, and the one in the conical floss can be lasted. Alright, um, let me know if you're confused. Uh, I will explain that in the live session again. Right, now look, let's say, in this case, based on this graph, I'm going to draw the things out. This is a, a um, burette, conical flask. Okay, inside here is supposed to be NOH. Here is HCl. Why do I know this? See that? On the x-axis, volume of acid right this volume is referring something that is in the burette something in the burette will be appear at the uh, x-axis because this is the thing that is independent they are changing you're adding the amount of HCl added will determine the concentration of NOH in the conical flask so this is changing see that from zero and go all the way increasing okay because I'm keep adding HCl into the NOH Right. So what happened initially, the graph started from here. The initial pH is 14, that makes sense because I use NOH which is a strong base. And then when I start adding acid into it, drop by drop, you see that the pH is decreasing slowly because this is the part where the NOH is neutralizing by the HCl. Slowly up to this point, you see that? Up to this point. And then it experiences a sharp change down and stop so this whole thing the whole vertical region we call this as the equivalent point okay now to be exact when you have the whole vertical region here you take the midpoint of it which is here the midpoint of the vertical region okay and this is the point where your NOH has been fully neutralized okay has been fully neutralized so this is the region where the reaction has complete. After this region, you see that? Let's say after this region, I, I'm still adding HCl. Therefore, the pH is still decreasing. Decrease, 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 until it stays constant after this. Which plateau? Why? Because I'm adding excess, too much of HCl. At the end, the pH in the solution, same as the pH of the HCl here, which is quite low about one see that it's a strong acid so ph1 makes sense so this is how a titration works and this is how it looks like um, when i'm adding acid into an NOH and this is the whole process of how the ph changes so the most important thing is the vertical region here this region we call that as the equivalent point and this is the region where your indicator should change color now, in the diagram, it shows two different indicators here. I have phenoxylin, I have methyl orange. Now, what is the function of putting this region in? Is phenoxylin, this region, uh, the changes, this is the region where the indicator will change color. Okay? Does this region within the long vertical line here, within the equivalence point? Yes. What about methyl orange? This is the pH range where the methyl orange will change color. Does this within the long equivalence point range? It's still within that, right? So yes. So both are actually a suitable indicator for a titration between a strong acid and strong base. Make sense? So this is how a titration between strong acid and strong base work. And what happened at the equivalence point? Equivalence point, the pH is seven. See that? The midpoint of it and I get a pH seven. Why? Because when NOH plus HCl they neutralize each other, you get NaCl plus H2O. Neutral, NaCl is also neutral, therefore pH is 7. Alright, this is how it looks like, and moving on. Now this one, we will go in more details in, in next semester, but uh, let me roughly explain that to you so that uh, you get the, the, the theory. Now, strong acid and weak base, what if you have a weak base? Let's say, for example, NH3, and this is HCl. What if you are titrating strong acid weak base? If you realize that, your equivalence point, this region, 
is actually much lower. They, are, they fall, this region, they fall under acidic pH. See that? So equivalence point is slightly acidic for a reaction between strong acid and weak base. What about between weak acid? Let's say I have vinegar with NOH, which is a strong base. This is a weak acid. When you titrate these two, you see that the equivalence point is actually in the alkaline region. So it's higher. So a conclusion is, for a reaction between strong acid and weak base, the equivalence point is below 7. For a reaction between weak acid and strong base, the equivalence point is above 7. So that's what you need to know. Because in exam, they might ask you, what, uh, which range would you think the equivalence point falls into when a reaction between HCR and a weak base? Then it should be any value below 7. For a weak acid and strong base, any value below uh, above 7. For weak acid and strong base. Alright? See that? Okay, now the rest, uh, for example, these are uh, salt hydrolysis, and this one, um, we will go in details again in SAM2. So you don't have to actually know this now, but you need to know this. These are the conclusion from the three graphs that I show you. A reaction between strong acid and strong base, you will get a neutral solution, pH 7. A titration between strong acid and weak base, you will get an acidic solution, pH less than 7. A reactions between weak acid and strong base, you will get a basic solution or alkaline solution, pH more than 7. These are the points, uh, these are all the equivalence points for different reactions. Okay, so you might read through this and this on your own. Okay, then you will know why is it producing uh, an acidic solution. But if you are not clear about this, ask me again on that. Okay, the most important is you know the equivalence point for different acid base reactions. All right? And um, next one, we look at primary standard. Why do I need to introduce a primary standard here? Now, the primary standard in lab, okay, it should have the following characteristics. For example, um, just now I have a titration, right? Okay, let's say this is HCl, which is unknown. I don't know the concentration. And here, I need to use an NOH to react with it with known concentration. Okay, see that? So this one with known concentration and is used to standardize or determine the concentration, sorry, the concentration of um, the concentration of The concentration of HCl. I use this as a standard to determine the concentration of HCl. And this solution we call that as this compound we call that as a primary primary standard. Okay? So what are the characteristics of primary standard? Number one, it must be a high purity and known formula. Uh, talking about high purity, it should be labeled on the bottle itself, the reagent bottles. When you open it, you take the NNH out, they should label that. What is the purity in percentage? 99%, 98%. That's considered high. All right? It does not react with air. So you will not react with air. Otherwise, when you open the bottle, it starts reacting with air. The NOH will not be NOH anymore after reacting with air. So that will affect the whole reaction. So a primary standard should be pure enough and it shouldn't react with air. Next, reasonably reasonably high molar mass. Now this is a bit blur, as in how high is considered high molar mass, right? So I will not encourage you to, to look at this or remember these characteristics. Okay, um, what about soluble in water? Yeah, this is important. So these points, one, two, and three, these three points are important. Okay, first it must able to dissolve in water. Otherwise, if I want to prepare an NOH solution in zero point five mol per dm cube, but NOH is insoluble in water, so how does how how can you do that? 
right? How can you use that to, to titrate this HCl? First, it must be able to dissolve in water, it must not react with air, and it must be in high purity. So this is the primary standard. We will learn that further in lab, in fact, okay, uh, for primary standard, but you need to know now because we are introducing titration. Okay, clear? So next, buffer solution. Again, this is also important only when we are in SAM2, but you need to know what is a buffer solution. Now, a buffer solution is a solution that maintain the pH. Okay, what does that mean? For example, I have a, a beaker of buffer solution. Okay, the pH of this buffer solution, let's say pH 3. Okay, this solution is pH 3. And I try to put in NOH in small amount, let's say 3 drops. Do you think the pH will change? No, it will still maintain as plus minus pH 3. A bit, not that much. Okay, so plus minus pH 3. If you add uh, 3 drops of HCl instead, do you expect the pH to change? Again, it's a no. It will still maintain as plus minus pH 3. That's the function of a buffer. But imagine that if this were a, a solution, which is just a water, if you add 3 drops of NOH, initially it's pH 7. So what do you think when you add 3 drops of NOH in it? The pH will shoot up to pH 10. For example, 10, 20, uh, 10, 11, 12, 14, right? Again, if I add a few drops of HCl, three drops again, what do you think about the pH? From 7, it will shoot up, uh, you shoot down, okay, going down because it's acidic. It will go to pH 3, 4, or even 2, 1. So that is a normal solution, water. But for buffer, they will maintain it. With condition, guys, only small amount of acid base added, which is here stated. If I'm not adding three drops to this buffer, I'm adding 50 centimeter cubic into the buffer solution, which is also 50 centimeter cubic. What do you expect? The pH will? Did it still remain the same? No, of course it will change because you are adding excess. So this buffer solution will only keep the pH constant when you add small amount of acid or small amount of base into it. Okay, and we have two different types of buffer here. We have acidic buffer, we have alkaline buffer. Like just now, the examples that I gave, buffer here equals to pH 3. So what do you think? This is actually a acidic buffer. And why do we need different pH of a buffer solution? Because certain chemical reactions, okay? Certain chemical reactions, they need to carry out, they need to conduct these experiments, these reactions under acidic conditions. Otherwise, the reactions will not progress. So how can you maintain the pH under acidic conditions? The best way is use acidic buffer because we know that this buffer solution will not change the pH. It will try to control the pH at maintain it at acidic region. So that's the best thing to use. But some reaction, they only progress in alkaline pH, for example. Then what to do? we use an alkaline buffer. Okay, so that's uh, one of the functions, one of the purpose of having buffer solution. In our body, we have buffer solution as well to maintain our pH, uh, the blood pH. All right, later I'll show you the next slide. Um, that's the, the, the one in our body. Now before that, I need to explain a little bit what is acidic buffer, right? Uh, acidic buffer is always a mixture of a weak acid and the salt of the acid. Okay, what does that mean by a weak acid and salt of the acid? For example, I have a weak acid, in this case, CH3COOH, this is a weak acid. And what is the salt of this acid? The salt of this acid is just the sodium metal, sodium ethanoid. This is ethanoic acid. And here is sodium ethanoid. You see that? So you just take out the H, which is changing into H+, and you change it into a metal. Sodium is a common one. Then you get, when you mix these two together, the acid and the salt in the same molarity, same concentration, you will get a acidic buffer. 
always. All right. For alkaline buffer, again the same thing, but it's a base, of course. You need a weak base, ammonia, for example, NH3, and you need the salt of the base, ammonia. So what is the salt of the ammonia? Ammonium chloride. Just put a salt in. This is a salt. Ammonia change in ammonium chloride. So this is a salt, and this is a base. Okay, this is the base and this is the salt of this particular base. You cannot put any random salt, guys. For example, I'm using uh, ammonia here and then I put in NaCl. Does it work? No. Okay, you must put in the salt of that particular base. So this is how you get acidic and alkaline buffer. And how does buffer work? As I said, we will learn that in details again in SEN 2. This is just an introduction in SEN 1. You just need to know how to get an acidic buffer, how to get an alkaline buffer with what compound. All right, but if you keen to know more, let me know. I'll explain that in the uh, live session. All right. Okay, last one, a buffer in blood. So the pH of our blood need to maintain in a range of 7.35 to 7.45. And how can this happen? All right, how can this happen? Drinking alkaline water. If you realize that there's a lot of uh, water industry, like uh, the water filtration company, they are selling so-called alkaline water. Does that going to help to maintain our pH of our blood? I tell you what, alkaline water is a nonsense. Okay, the whole thing was a lie, and no such thing as alkaline water are maintaining our health. Alkaline water are reducing the acidity of our body. No such thing. All right. Again, if you want to know more, I explain to you. If you know chemistry, you should know that these so-called alkaline water are just nonsense. All right. Now, based on this um, buffer in the in the blood, how do we compare it? We have carbon dioxide in our body, right? We 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 breathe in oxygen and convert it in carbon dioxide. Now we breathe it out, of course, but not all the carbon dioxide will breathe out, will exhale out, right? So some of the carbon dioxide will dissolve in our blood, because our blood composed of seventy percent. Uh, most of it is actually plasma, which is water. So what happens when carbon dioxide dissolves in water? You are actually getting carbonic acid. And this carbonic acid can be in equilibrium with bicarbonate ions and H+. So how does this thing actually control the pH? It's very simple. I'll show you this. Last one, guys. If this is the system, all right, this is the equilibrium in our blood. Now I eat a lot of acidic food. All right, acidic food means what? Means your food will consist a lot of H plus, right? Concentrated of H plus. So I eat a lot of acidic food and this concentration of H plus will be added into the equilibrium. So you are adding H plus into it. And what happened? You learned this equilibrium uh, from a previous topic. What happened when you add H plus into it? This will increase. When this increase, the equilibrium will shift to the left. When you shift to the left, this H plus will combine with this to form this. Isn't it indirectly we are decreasing the H plus? When you shift to the left. So when you shift to the left, it decreases the H plus. It decreases the concentration of the H plus. And what happened next? pH will increase. Right? The one that has added in will change to this carbonic acid by shifting the equilibrium to the left and therefore the pH value of our blood will remain in the range of 7.35 to 7.45 unless this system fails. When this system fails means something wrong with our blood and that's a disease, right? So that is a different story. If it is a normal condition, our blood will have this system and this system is the one that shift left and right in order to maintain the pH and this is how a buffer system works in our body. Okay, The one that we discussed here is actually not the buffer, it's a chemical buffer, it's a man-made buffer and this is naturally in our body that can maintain the pH of our blood. Alright, so I guess that's it for the video and uh, thank you for watching. I will upload the tutorial video uh, next.